So, good afternoon, welcome, and thank you for joining us in today's panel discussion. My name is Nadia Murray, PhD candidate in geostatistics at Ecole Polytechnique Montreal, and along with Daniel Morales, master engineer at McGill University, we will be hosting the panel organized by ReadySec, Chile Canada Research Network. ReadySec aims to develop activities that promote knowledge dissemination, emphasizing Chile's international role in scientific research. Today's panel discussion will be recorded and uploaded to ReadySec YouTube channel. Today, we are discussing challenges, innovation, and AI in mining. Chilean and Canadian's perspective, presented by Sebastián Carmona and Julián Ortiz. Sebastián is an industrial engineer and master of mining from Universidad de Chile, and also master in finance from London Business School, with mining experience in Chile, England, and Pakistan. He worked in several positions at Colelco, the largest copper producer in the world, including general manager at Colelco Tech, head of sustainability at Gabriela Mistral Mine, and corporate head of innovation. Currently, he holds the position of chief innovation officer at Colelco as well. On the other hand, Dr. Julian Ortiz is a mining engineer from Universidad de Chile and PhD uh, in mining engineering from University of Alberta. Currently, he is an associate professor at the Department of Mining at Queen's University, where he teaches and conducts research related to geostatistics, stochastic modeling of ore deposits, and geometallurgical modeling. Previously, he worked as an associate professor at the Department of Mining Engineering at Universidad de Chile. He was also deputy director of the Advanced Mining Technology Center and director of, of the Alges Lab. He has several publications in journals and international conferences. So having presented our guests, here is the agenda for today's panel. Julian and Sebastian will share their opinions and experiences about three main topics. First, they will discuss the main challenges in mining for Chile and Canada. After this, they will talk about innovation in mining. And finally, they will mention possible uh, AI applications in the mining industry. They will close the panel giving their perspective about the future trend in mining for the next 10 years. To conclude, we will have time for a Q&A section. So if you have any inquiries during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom chat and I'll bring them up when the panel is over. Now, without further ado, let's begin with the panel. Thank you, thank you, Nadia. And thank you to Sebastian and Julian for joining, joining here in the panel discussion. Maybe one thing just before to start, um, if we people can write in the chat uh, where, which organization they're coming from and where they're connecting from, just to have an idea of um, the reach of this talk. So maybe we can just jump into the topics now. Um, so the first topic is the challenges in mining. So I would like to start the conversation with this question, um, which are the global challenges that the mining industry is facing right now? So maybe uh, we can start with Sebastian to, uh, what's your take on the global challenges of mining? Your mute, yes. Um, well, um, hello to everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, if I'm speaking too fast or too loud, just let me know. Right. So the challenges of mining, uh, although I can speak a lot about it, I think my, my first take, I'm going to refer on the challenges of large copper miner, which is basically what I know and what I know the most. The first one and, and, and the key one, at least in Chile for us, is uh, sustainability. And when I'm talking about sustainability, I'm talking about this, when you, when you think of mining here in Chile, they think on open pits, they think on tailing sum, they think also on the large um, water consumption that we have and the dust pollution. 
I think those are the four drivers. And, and it's fair to say that the, the community and the countries, at least Chile, is not comfortable with, with the way we have been doing mining anymore. They, they, they were before, and everything that we do is legal, but I think that the tolerance for the way we do mining uh, is not longer going to be there 10 years from now or 20 years from now. There are several countries where open pit mining is not allowed anymore, where cyanide for uh, gold leaching is not allowed anymore as well. Uh, so there are constraints. There are constraints when we use arsenic. There are many, many constraints. So, so I think the main challenge that we face is this, the, the, that the people and the, the investors, not only the communities, but now the investors are asking and demanding for us to do uh, things differently. How differently? I don't know, but uh, it has to do with, with less waste dumps, with less and smaller tailing dumps, with less water consumption, especially if continental water. Um, with uh, non-dust pollution, they are also asking us to reduce our carbon foot uh, emissions as well. So, so we have to think mining all over again. And, and I think that's the number one challenge. And the second challenge uh, that we are facing, and this is something that we miners have been facing for the last thousands of years, is that the, our, our mine sites, our deposits deteriorate through time, right? We're getting deeper, lot, grades are getting lower, the rock is getting harder. Uh, and so, so those are the two main drivers that I think are, are the key drivers for innovation, for, for us to keep, keep on thinking new ways of doing stuff, for PhD people to keep on learning and trying new things, and for us as mining companies to also to try and explore new opportunities and new initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, Julian, what will you, your take on that? Yeah, um, well, first, thanks for inviting me uh, to ReadySec, and it's nice to be with uh, some, some of the people I, I've known for a long time, so good to see Sebastian, Nadia, and, and Danielle. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I guess, repeat some of the things that Sebastian just mentioned. Uh, I think uh, if we look at the, at the main challenges, uh, sustainability as a whole is a big one. Uh, engagement with the communities uh, in Canada in particular is, a, is also a big deal. Um, doing mining in a, in, a, in a way that doesn't affect indigenous communities in, in Canada is, is extremely relevant. Um, I would say a second aspect of, uh, of the sustainability is the environment. So tailings, as Sebastian mentioned, is, is important. And in Canada, there is a big uh, problem with the oil sand tailings in, in Alberta. Uh, tailing dams are also a problem. We know the, the accidents that have occurred in, in the last few years and, and it's, this is not new. It has happened before and it continues to happen and it shouldn't. Um, I would say a second big challenge for mining is it has to do with public relations and, and the image that we have as an industry. I think every time there is a dam accident, we uh, go back 20 years in our reputation. And you know, I think that's one of the main uh, things that affect what we do and how we're perceived from outside the industry. Um, another aspect that I think it's challenging has also, also has to do with sustainability in, in terms of the use of energy and water and the best use we can make of the raw, the raw materials that we mine. Uh, so, uh, all the challenges related to green mining, so conversion to renewable energies is, is an, an interesting challenge, I guess, for, for us. Um, moving away from carbon-based uh, resources, so oil and gas, uh, oil sands are debated by the public whether we should keep using and should keep mining those things. So I, I think we have to be conscious about those problems. And I guess if we look inside the industry, um, I can see a very interesting uh, challenge in uh, digitalization of the mines. So trying to take the mines really to a level where things are 
um, uh, intelligent in a sense, so we, where we actually have intelligent systems working in the minds and making decisions. Um, so I, I think those are, I would say, the main challenges of, of the mining industry. And they're not exclusive, I guess, to Canada or Chile. I think they're, they're worldwide. The big topic here and in like in the, into the challenges. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe just short before going to to the next topic. Uh, what about the role of mining to provide them with the metals for the industry also? For example, I'm just thinking people is talking about, about the electric cars and battery, all the minerals that this component will require. Uh, is mining prepared to provide all those elements? Uh, what would you be, maybe Julian and then uh, Sebastian? So that's, that's a good point. I think there is a, this has to do with the, the, the raw materials problem, the supply. Um, I, I think there is a significant challenge with providing those, those uh, metals that are required for the new technologies. Um, and, and also I feel there is a problem with, again, the perception of the public. So if you look at some companies, some tech companies that say, uh, we're only going to re recycle and use recycled materials, that's probably unrealistic because they don't realize how, how much they need. And, and if we want to keep the level of consumption, I'm not saying we should, I'm just saying if, if that continues, um, then we, I, I, I think the demand for raw materials is going to continue increasing. And, and uh, this is going to fall into the economic cycle. If we get more demand then prices are going to go up and new companies are going to invest, we're going to continue developing new projects. But uh, I don't think it's, it's a, a long-term sustainable solution. I think we should increase significantly the reuse and the recycling uh, processes that we have on all the garbage that we have in the earth. Uh, but so far, I don't think that's going to be enough to cover for the demand. Thank you, Julian. What's your take on that, uh, Sebastian? You can, I always, it's mute, Sebastian, it's mute. You can. Yeah. So, so I have a slightly difference with Julian there. I, I think that demand from electric cars for at least copper is uh, negligible, or is not as relevant as, as much copper you use for transmission lines or building cities. It's just it's not the same. So, so my, I, I, I'm pretty sure that demand is going to be there, and, and, and the resources are there as well. But I, I, I feel, and, and Julian is right, prices are going to go up because there's no enough supply and there's no, there are not enough, nearly enough large projects coming on stream. And we see that happening in Copa, and at least in Chile, no new, no new greenfield project has been approved in the last 10 years. Only brownfield projects. And, and if you go and look at the US or what's happening in Australia or Canada, at least in copper, there's not much new copper coming in. Uh, Peru opened a couple of mines two or three years ago, but that's it. So there's going to be a, 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 we see in the long term, an enormous uh, shortage of supply, I think, for copper. And, and the demand is going to be there and it's going to be healthy. Uh, and I, I don't, as Julian said, I don't see that, I don't see that it's realistic for, for many companies to do this recycling. Uh, but there is a space, but there's a space for electronics and cars, right? But you're not going to be recycling the copper that is deployed or the aluminum that is deployed on transmission lines or inside a building that just stay there. So, so I see that the demand for metals is healthy. If you see the, the metal prices, even in this pandemic, they're still very, very healthy. And, and there's no explanation for that, but maybe a mid to long term faith and conviction from the market that the demand is going to be there regardless, right? Um, so, so yeah, I think the market, the, the prices are going to be healthy and uh, the demand is going to be there. And I'm not sure the supply is going to be there because as Julian said also, sustainability becomes the bottleneck to transform these resources into reserves. It's not economics, it's not prices, it's not technology, but it's this, this, this uh, 
I don't know, sustainability or community uh, approval for you to go ahead with a new project. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Julian, for what you've taken. Well, time is gone, so maybe now we're gonna, once we have identified like the, the challenges, maybe we can jump into the second uh, topic of this talk, which is uh, innovation in mining. So, um, um, Sebastian, um, how is innovation? You are the CIO of um, Coelco, Chief Innovation Officer. So how is innovation being used to, to face these challenges? How you see in practice uh, how innovation is applied to, to solve these challenges? Yeah, um, we have, we, we, we use innovation in two ways, I think. The first one and the more strategic one is that the good thing about mining and this is something we always complain about the challenges and the challenges and the challenges. But the one good thing about mining is that we know what kind of mineral is going to come in our deposit 10 years from now or even 20 years from now, right? Because we have measured that, we have it in the mine plan. So we know what kind of copper is coming. You know the grade of the copper, you know the hardness of the copper, you know how it's going to behave in the processing plant. So, so we know that for Codelco for the next 50 years. We know, we sort of know where the copper is going to come from each one of our deposits, right? Uh, so with that, we know what are the challenges that we have on sustainability and on the economics to bring that copper on stream, right? So, so for example, in the Coelco case, we have defined three, three challenges that come from sustainability and it has to do with arsenic, with water, with tailings, with those sorts of things, right? And we know we have to address those if we want to be comfortable in keeping extract the, I, and it, if we are going to be able to extract that or in the next 50 years. So we are doing a lot of innovation projects towards that end on sustainability. But also Codelco has an, um, has an incredible amount of resources, not resources, but resources lying there. So we're working on four different technologies to unlock those resources and transform it into reserves. And when I'm saying about that, I'm thinking about the common technologies, which is uh, sulfide leaching, in situ leaching, uh, this block cave under high stress conditions, and pre-concentration, which means, you know, or sorting or improving the, the, the grade. Those are the four key technologies that we believe are, can, can unlock that value. So that's long term. And in the short term also, there are many suppliers working with us on, on bringing new flotation cells, new sensors for the millings. So we also have a short-term strategy where we're trying to test and deploy whatever is on the market that we can, we can improve our, 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 our economics and our business on a yearly basis, right? So we have this short, long-term and short-term strategy. That's how we work. Strategic changes uh, managed by you and the um, more particular for each uh, uh, processing part by the, the providers, the suppliers that you have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Julian, um, in terms of, of uh, research, um, you have experience in Chile and Canada. Um, uh, what are the differences in the research environment between Chile and Canada? Um, well, that's, that's a good question. And, and I think the, the main difference is the type of mining we do. I, I, I think Sebastian pointed out that Chile is all about extremely large deposits, um, extremely large mines, uh, very complex operations. Uh, I, I think, and, and there is also something related to the challenges because of the location of the mines. I think uh, lots of the mines in Chile are in Northern Chile and they're kind of far from most communities. If you look at the operations that are in, in the central part of the country, they're closer to the valleys where agriculture happens, where the cities happens, and that's where you get more constraints regarding uh, how to manage the waste, you know, how to access the water, how much energy you use, all, the, all those things. Uh, I think in Canada, the, the, the size of the mines is smaller, so you get more mines, but smaller in size. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the management, I guess, is slightly different because the impacts are not as uh, massive as they are in large, large open pits, for example. I think the only difference 
happens in the oil sands in Canada, which is kind of a different uh, species of, uh, of problem. Um, uh, I would say that in terms of the research, um, the, uh, you, can, you can look at research in different, with different lenses. One is the technology aspects of it and the innovation and the AI and all that. Uh, the other one is research related to how to engage with communities and how to manage more of the social aspects and the, the community relation aspects of, of mining. Uh, in Canada, there is an emphasis on both aspects. I, I, I think in Chile, there isn't much uh, social research uh, in, related to mining. The impacts are the same, uh, but, but I think in terms of the research, there is a difference there. Uh, and I, I would uh, complement the, uh, the answer that uh, Sebastian made before in terms of um, the, the, the main issues with uh, innovation have to do with uh, efficiency, I think. And efficiency in a sense of understanding and optimizing how we use the resources we have. So water is, is a big problem. We know that and we, we want to minimize the use of fresh water in the operations. Energy is a big problem, but I think currently we don't have an optimized approach to the use of water and energy. There are some very interesting ideas such as using solar energy uh, and, and mining uh, harder rock or, or processing harder rock when you have cheaper energy, so during the summer. So that's a different kind of planning if you think about it. It's actually developing the mine with a different mindset in terms of how do you plan and how do you manage the use of the resources that we need for uh, processing and, and recovering the elements we're looking for. So I think those are, those are the main aspects that make it slightly different. Uh, the, the other obvious thing I think is that in terms of energy in Chile, uh, we can use the sun. In Canada, it's kind of cold and not as sunny. So I think there is a big difference there as well. Thank you, thank you, Julian. Um, and maybe a question also from uh, to both. Um, maybe we can start with Julian. Is like, is there any transfer of know-how between Chile and Canada? I mean, we have uh, different environments, but even like if there are um, in Chile, the mines are in the north, in the desert, and you have like a scarce scarcity of water. But there is there transfer of know-how some somehow between uh, these countries, uh, Julian? Yeah, I, I would say that yes. Uh, I, I think mining is is a global industry, and and many of the professionals that work in mining move around a lot. Uh, the companies also provide the opportunity of working more than one asset, so people that work before in one asset in one country move to another. So I think there is a lot of knowledge knowledge being transferred. Uh, the other source for uh, uh, transferring know how is actually the providers. The providers, they, they, they work, providers and consultants, right? They work in, in, in assets everywhere. So they tend to bring or facilitate, you know, the acquisition of new technology or new ideas in, in different countries. So I would say there isn't a separate market maybe in, in this, although it's a bit unrelated, Australians are slightly more isolated than what we see between Chile and Canada. Okay, so there is that you see the transfer. Okay, Sebastian, do you see any transfer of knowledge or know how between Chile and Canada? You have to unmute. Yeah, uh, yes, there's a lot, a lot. But you have to remember that, that mining is a very specific industry that is uh, very concentrated in the world in a few countries. So, so and, and universities, and suppliers are also very concentrated in a few selected countries. You have to remember that before the UK had a lot of research. You had the Imperial College of London and, and, and a lot of universities and a lot of coal mines as well. So Europe 20 years ago was a hub of mining, which is not longer the case. South Africa also in the last 10 years, I have seen less and less activity and less and less uh, doctors and professors uh, coming from there. But before you had uh, Daniel Cray, you had uh, the people from University of Winter Water, so, uh, Julian knows the name. Uh, <laughs> um, but not anymore. Even in the US, 
10 years ago, 20 years ago, the Colorado School of Mines was huge. Uh, and there was a lot of things going on. But uh, we are seeing less and less activity in those countries, and we're seeing more and more activity coming from Canada, from Australia, and from Chile. And that's it. So, so it's very common for us to, to work with Canadian suppliers. It's very common to us to connect with uh, universities such as McGill or UBC or Alberta or Queens. Um, and also from universities from Australia. Um, and Chile is, a, is a, as a late comer, and I would say we are a late comer. We are, we, we are yet to provide to, to brought most of our suppliers to Canada or to Australia. We have maybe five or 10 suppliers from Chile trying to work with mines, mines in Canada and Australia. And, but Julian, for example, is a good example of how in these countries you move from the University of Chile in Chile to Canada and that work. And again, this, I believe those, these links are just going to get stronger as there's no much more where we can go to. So we are, we are, we are going to be working with Australia and Canada uh, from Chile and that's it. As a um, question in this topic uh, is um, uh, maybe Julian, you can say something about how is the research in the academy related with the innovation in industry? Do you see like a stream pipeline from the research going to uh, in the academy in, in academia to go to the industry, or there's something there happening? What's your well? Uh, I I think that uh, the same things happen in all countries. You have uh, universities doing research up to a point that's usually insufficient for industry to take it and to apply directly. So uh, you, you'll find that there is a lot of important fundamental research, I think, uh, kind of basic research that has to be done and that is being done at universities, usually with government funding. Then there is a kind of a second area of applied research where you try, you pilot some ideas in kind of a real uh, industrial setting. So uh, with collaboration with mine sites or providers. Um, and then there is a little gap that's really when you develop that uh, technology into a, a product that can be, you know, transfer and where you have some, some level of a, uh, warranty that the, the, the product is going to work in all settings. So you have kind of different liabilities in terms of the the, the research there. And that's where all the, um, the, the, the startups and the innovation kind of technology companies should take, right? That, that uh, gap that happens between what is done at university that only reaches a given point and what actually industry is demanding. Um, uh, I would say that in, in terms of uh, the research that we see, we, we have uh, basically the entire value chain or entire mining cycle is being covered by different researchers in different aspects. We see centers uh, in Chile, like the Advanced Mining Technology Center doing broad research in all aspects of mining. I think there are similar centers here in Canada working, some of them closer to industry. But I think there is always that, uh, that gap that needs uh, kind of a third party, which is, uh, small technology companies taking up uh, e ideas that are developed in, in, in research and, and trying to bring them into a, a business model and a product. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Um, yeah, I don't know if we keep in topic or we jump into another, Nadia, uh, help me with the time. We jump to the next, or we have time for another question here. Um, okay, so it's time to, um, we're going to change to the topic of AI, this buzzword that is, uh, we hear a lot in AI in mining. Um, so, so Julian, um, well, I've seen a little bit of your work and you are doing, Sebastian, you want to say something? No, I'm just saying that it's my turn to, for you to ask me. So. Okay, okay, so Sebastian, I will start with you. Okay, my friend. Um, so Sebastian, talking about AI in mining. Which are the, the current implementation of the AI in industry? Yeah. Um, so, 
artific artificial intelligence is a big word, right? But uh, but usually when people talking about artificial intelligence, sometimes they confuse themselves with algorithms of control. And we have been using algorithms for 50 years, 60 years. Now, when you're talking about AI, you're talking about algorithms that are learning continuously, right? And we are doing some of that. Um, and But it's just like a second layer of one thing that we have been already been doing, which is algorithm of control and replacing the human or the human decision making by a computer decision making, which should work better. Um, and I think we, we did that first, we started working on that maybe 40 years ago, 30 years ago, um, with softwares in everywhere for mind planning, especially, and um, those sort of things, right? And, and right now we're using artificial intelligence when we already have that algorithm of control. And I can tell you an example that we did in Teniente with, uh, with the MIDI. We, so we already had that, that processing plan. Or with a profit algorithm of control coming from Honeywell with all the sensors. So, so it was moving automatically, right? But we wanted to challenge. We wanted to challenge that settings of that optimum, global optimum. So we built a digital twin. Uh, we start running simulations and we start asking for the model to self-learn new things and, and to start challenging the conventional uh, optimum, right? And we did it, and we actually got a, fifth, a nice 5% increase in throughput uh, through that. But that's about the only case that I know of really, uh, and we use data science for that and all that, of really using, using artificial intelligence. If you like to call that to, to when you have random forest and you have a, a learning algorithm, right? Before, uh, and, and that's it. All of, all of the others are just algorithms of control. And I think the, the industry have been using that for a while. And having said that, before jumping into artificial intelligence, I would say there's a lot of space still in the industry to replace the human decision making for just optimum algorithms. And then, and if that works well and you have the discipline, then you may then jump into artificial intelligence, but that's what just gonna give you a marginal point of later compared to, to the big jump that you do when you jump from, uh, from the human decision making to, to a more uh, computer-based decision making. That would be my, take, my first uh, opinion. Evolution of the control uh, mechanism and algorithm and kind of, um, it's, it's, you don't see it as a disruptive technology, you just see more like a marginal yeah, I mean, I mean this, is, this is something very important to say. When, when artificial intelligence and, uh, and, and digital transformation as a concept, they, they are very huge on the B2C industry. When you're trying to sell things through here and you want to understand your consumers, then yes, you want to come in new data and that can transform and that can take the competition out. In the mining industry, you have the meal that you bought and you have the processing capacity of 100,000 tons per day, and with artificial intelligence, you're not going to get to 200,000 tons per day. So you're not going to disrupt your business. You're going to do things better. You can jump 5% or 10% and you can get closer to the design capacity and maybe challenge that a little bit. But you're not going to fundamentally change okay. the, the track. It's just going to be the track with the speed and with the 400 tons that it's going to carry and maybe it's going to increase the speed five kilometers per hour it's so because taking optimum decisions are, but that's it but it's not going to go to 200 kilometers it's not going to transport 1000 tons or anything like that so it's not going to be disruptive okay. it's going to be important because the mining industry is important as a size as a scale matter but you're not going to get out of business if you, you don't jump into artificial intelligence that's that's my opinion okay. thank you thank you sebastian um uh, Julian, what, what is your take on that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree on, on most of the things uh, Sebastian said. Okay. I think AI is a buzzword and, and everybody wants to have it and it's fine. And we're at the hype now at the top of the, you know, excitement about it. Um, but the same kind of concepts have been around for a long time. So they were called expert systems before and they were basically systems that learned something and they would keep gathering data to try to improve their uh, prediction um, and and the rest i think is mostly um uh, as uh, 
predictive models, statistical methods that are being developed and, and they're new and they're interesting and we have more power than before. Uh, so that means we can use better the data we have. And I think that's where the gain is. Um, so instead of throwing the data and, and just spending time, you know, taking photographs of drill holes, we can actually use them, for example, right? Um, now, I would say that the only place where um, there might be some interesting possibilities is if we are able actually to model the whole thing and, and build a digital twin of a project. Maybe a simulation before we do it and a digital twin for control. Uh, then we can actually test a kind of disruptive alternatives. But for that, we need data, we need models, and we need to have the technology to do it quickly. I think we're taking steps in that direction, but it's, it's, uh, it, we're not there yet. We're not uh, building digital twins on a routinely base uh, at all. And, and finally, I would, I would also um, agree with the, where the value is. I think the value is in, in the decision automation. So if we can actually make the systems take decisions that, that are using all the data, assimilating all the data that we have, and, and and making the optimum decision, uh, that, that is an, an incremental gain with respect to what we have today where many decisions are made on the run without all the information and without actually analyzing the data we have. Okay, so just summarize, you see the real value just when we can have this uh, digital twin actually implementing in the mind. But beside that, you also agree that maybe they're marginal uh, Improves, improving for a mind to, to, to use a, some subset of AI. I, I think the example that Sebastian gave of a 5% increase in throughput is huge in money. I mean, it's, it's a huge in, improvement. Uh, so I think there is a lot of value we can squeeze from the data by using this technology, but it, it's not going to be a step change, I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we can keep with, with the question or maybe we can jump to the QA. Nadia, what's your take on that? Maybe we can keep with the question here. Okay, so I will have um, one, more, one more question. And so this is for, for Sebastian. So for example, um, you say, Sebastian, that you use uh, AI in, in mining, uh, in, in an example of the increasing of the 5% in the throughput. So maybe that happened for uh, just one mine or one mill, but how do you handle like this improvement to the many mines that Codelco have? You have like um, a method to scale this local improvement to other mines or transfer them? How, how is that is working out? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, having said that, um, most of the mines in the world, Codelco in particular, but there are other mines, uh, have different standards. Uh, sometimes, for example, if you go to Chuquicamata, we have some mills that come from 50 years old, that are 50 years old, and in Salvador, the same. So there are substandards on maintenance, there are substandards on the sensors and instrument. So, so there's still a lot of catch up to do before doing these ambitious things. And what I'm trying to say is that mining and mining equipment is sometimes you bought it from different suppliers with 20 years difference. So you want to go there, but every single mine is, is, is its own world and it's in a different stage. So I think Odelco is going to go to the to expand to the other mines once the other mines are ready by doing some, some of the more hygienic thing that you have to do. And I think uh, miners usually operate that. We all have tier one assets, tier two assets, tier three assets, all their assets, PHP, you know, they have Escondida, but they also have Cerro Colorado. And, uh, and I can assure you they treat both mines very differently. See, so, so that, yeah. Uh, finish this this topic of AI and here like the question from the attendees that they have and uh, maybe Nadia we can can help us with that with the question that people have done in the chat and and have it if you yeah. can unmute yes thank you Daniel yeah we have a couple of questions uh, the first one is 
from Satori. Uh, he asked about, in terms of sustainability, could you say, Sebastian, reclamation is a major part. Does Coloco plan their reclamation alongside their production? Yeah, I, I replied that in the chat, but uh, but yeah, for sure. My by, by law, every single mining operator in Chile uh, has to plan. They already have a mine closure plan in place. They also, they, everybody has also put uh, um, installment and had budget the mine closure, and we have had to put a bank deposit on the cost of it. Uh, so so we are working on that. And, and the third question is yes, um, we have a couple of projects working on acid drainage and, and I was the contact of contacted water that can flow and leak uh, to the soil. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have another question to Sebastian. Yes, so Codelco's current focus is to transform resources into reserves through research on exploitation methods. Are you applying technology in the characterization and understanding of those deposits to support the extractive process? Yes, yes we are. We have a, also a portfolio of project with the exploration group. Uh, very interesting. We have working with AMIRA, we're working with the University of Chile. Uh, we're doing, we're trying to put some seismic uh, instrument there that can, that can extrapolate the seismicity activity and detect uh, mineral deposits. We're, trying, we're working very, very hard on, on increasing the productivity or the efficiency of the early exploration. That's for one side. And the second, I will say definitely on the, um, on the base drilling and the geometallurgical information, we are not doing a very good job, I think, as an industry. There's still much to learn. It has been a challenge for us in the last 20 years. We are always talking about um, mine to meal, mine to leach, uh, and those things, but, uh, but it's still a challenge. It's still, it's still a challenge. I don't, I don't think we, we have addressed that completely just yet. We are working on it, but, we, but there's still a lot of opportunities there. If I, if I can comment on that, I think one of the, um one of the missing aspects of, of uh, the research and the implementation of, of new technologies is actually looking at the problem in an integrated way. And there are management issues related to that because in a mine there are different uh, superintendents that own different data and have different KPIs. And I think if you look at the, the problem globally, uh, it would be ideal to have a very clean flow of information and data from the early exploration all the way down to the, the market. Um, because at the end, what you end up shipping really depends on what you had at the beginning. So if you could connect everything, that would be ideal. And I think there is a, a problem there. And as, as the question was posed, I think we have kind of fairly uh, hard limits between mining metallurgy from the other activities, from exploration and from what comes after that. Well, thank you, Julian and Sebastian. We have another question from Diego Leiva. Uh, he's asking about, Chile could be a great supplier for lithium batteries for electric car. What's your opinion in that matter? I'm going to give a short, a short comment about it. I think Chile had an opportunity with lithium, um, but there were some, some uh, uh, problems with the procedure to actually uh, provide the, the support from the government to, to the, the companies that were going to develop that industry. Uh, I think that's one of the limitations uh, of, of, of that industry. I think Chile is very focused on what we know best, and uh, that's where all the investment is going today, I think. Yeah, if, if I can comment, um, my, my answer will be, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we as miners, uh, we do mining, and, and we are not going to diversify into batteries. So it's a different industry. 
is a manufacturing industry, and I have no idea, and I don't feel responsible to comment on that. And this is not just Codelco. Uh, you have to remember that even private miners, nobody, nobody, no single miner is diversifying downstream. It's just not a good. It's not. It's just not a good business, and it's not what we do. So, so it's an interesting question for economic policy and manufacturing, but it's not a mining question. Um, maybe I just want to comment on on this aspect because yesterday was the uh, battery day of Tesla, and I believe they suggested that somehow they're going to have more vertical integration and. With the, with the production of their own batteries. Actually, uh, it, it was pointed out that all the lithium required for all the electrical mobility in the state, is already, all the lithium is already there in actually in, in Nevada and somehow uh, Tesla is getting a step in the door in that field. So somehow they are making like vertical integration but in accounting for also to the mining. But uh, as Sebastian says, it's not happening in the other direction. It's not like the miners go in the, in the uh, and it's not it's not a good business i mean mining mining once you have a deposit there's never going to be a, a a better business than this never there's nothing else that has that is different between income or revenue and operating cost nothing no business in the in the world no legal business so uh so and, and yeah and and even if if tesla wants to do that in North America, the permit for doing mining in North America takes 10 years on average. In the US. But I, I think you, you hit the, the point, Sebastian, when you said that this is not a mining problem, it's not from the mining companies, it's a, it's a problem of policy making for uh, economic development of a country. And, and I think that's exactly the problem I was trying to point at. That's where you know, if you wanted to develop that industry, you would need to incentivize other activities related to that so you can have some uh, additional benefits for society in order to justify it. But uh, I think we're, we're not there in Chile. Uh, some questions that I received in the, in the mail also. Yeah, you can go. Okay, so I received one from Ashish Kumar, and he's an um, AI specialist in Bali. And he's asking, um, how does the transfer of AI developments in academia end up in the industry? Uh, it's an open question. Maybe, Julian, you can say something. Yeah, um, I think all governments have some kind of a institution to try to make that connection so they will they will leverage funds or they will provide funds to leverage investment from mining companies so for example if vale as this is the case is interested in some possible technology that's being developed maybe at an early stage in a university then there are usually some kind of funds for engaging industry in research in applied research so the government is going to put some money, the company is going to put some money and that together is going to accelerate basically the development of that technology. I think the same kind of funding mechanism exists in the UK, in Chile, everywhere. Um, now, I, I think the, the, to make it work, you actually need to involve a third agent. Uh, so somebody who will actually take kind of the business side of the development uh, invest, you know, the many working hours to actually get it to a marketable product. And I think that's the uh, the tech companies. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And also from Ashish, uh, this question to Sebastian. And he says, like, how does Codelco make people understand the value of the new AI tools, for example, um, someone in the research can play with something that can have a potential um, effect, but somehow people in this re industry look reluctant to use them. Is there like, um, if the new technologies are coming um, in the eye, how do you make the, like actually the user or the people in demand actually use them? I don't know if you, Sebastian? 
That's a very interesting question and it's very easy to answer. Uh, at least in Chile, I'm, I'm gonna provide you an example in Chile. Two out of three workers inside a mine are contractors, are suppliers, are specialists in something, are helping you with something, right? So the best way of applying AI on mining is working with a supplier, with a supplier, for example, of a, of a mine planning software. And you say, you know what, we're gonna improve that because we are already a client of that mining software and they are gonna improve their services to us and we're gonna be willing, willing to pay for it, right? But for us, it's gonna be much challenging as a final client to say, you know what, we're gonna drop this mining supplier that we have been working for 50 years and that is very reliable and we're gonna start with this startup and we're gonna replace everything. It's much easier for us to, to, and to, to, to manage the change uh, if the other supplier, uh, a more conventional supplier that is already very re reliable, can work with the, with the AI company to improve their service. See, so I see that and I see as an easier way to, to, to work with. Mm. Um, for both, uh, from which other industry you see um, innovation uh, taken from? Is there a, the mining is seen in the development and other industry, either the tech com either the tech companies or I don't know petrol, oil and gas? Is there any on, another industry that mining can learn from? Um, Julian? Yeah, well. I, I think there are many industries where mining is stealing ideas from, uh, in a good sense. And, and maybe uh, I think is to what uh, Sebastian said before. Um, I don't know if my connection is good enough. I'm getting a message. Okay. Uh, that uh, mining projects are very long term. So you, you commit to things for 10, 20 or more years. And that makes it very slow in adapting and in uh, adopting new technologies as well. So we basically have uh, the possibility of looking at what other industries are doing. Because we're so slow paced, we have the opportunity of looking and copying the good things, hopefully after they have uh, experimented with them. Uh, I, I could think of, uh, you know, the banking companies in terms of data management, I can think of the oil and gas company in terms of drilling. Uh, I think there is there is uh, a lot to to look for in other comp in other uh, industries. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I agree a hundred percent with Julian. It's always very healthy, and we're always looking and learning from other other companies. But, but you have to remember that what Julian said is, is correct. You build a mine with, and you, or when you build a mine, a new mine, you are fixed with that technology or not, with 95 for that technology for life. You're not gonna replace your sack mill with, a, with another mill unless there are, there's a, like a, a step change on it. But, but that has never happened, right? Um, so, so we are late adopters. And, and we're always looking to, to, to apply other things from industry. And I think uh, uh, we are learning a lot of the digital world. I mean, whatever, everything, every jump that is being do, made in Silicon Valley or, or on telecoms, we can bring that and, and, use, and use it. And that, that's very easy for us. And, 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 and that's, we don't have to work. What I'm trying to say is that we don't have to be the ones that create digital technology. We have to be very good and applying that, right? But we don't have to be in the frontier because there are already industries already doing that. We have to be very good at focusing and developing things on our core business and saying geology, mining, metallurgy, and maybe water now. Those are the core business for us right now and nobody else is working on that. So if Canada, Australia, and Chile, universities and companies do not work on that, we're, we're never gonna get any solution because Nobody else is working. Nobody else, no Harvard, no MIT, or even they even care about, you know, tailing stamps or whatever. That that's not okay. just not what they do. Focus right. on your main issues. On, 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 and and that's one. focus. And in the other, in digital or whatever, we have to be very good in learning, adapting, and deploying. Okay. Thank you.
Nadia, maybe there are some questions in the chat. Uh, maybe, maybe yeah. Can, maybe the, la, maybe the last a, ones. Not to yeah, check a couple time. of times. Uh, yeah. yeah, we have a question from Stefania Milla Moreno to Sebastian, and it's about the inclusion of phyto remediation initiatives that she is doing a research on that. Uh, if it's possible that could include that uh, approach. Okay, uh, but, and she also wonders about female representation. Yeah, that's the other one. <laughs> so, so in phyto the theory and remediation, maybe Julian can work a little bit because I have never ever heard that word before. Not in English, nor in Spanish, not, not ever. So I have no idea why it works. But is it phyto, is phyto remediation? Is it? Uh, sí. ¿Eso significa fito remediación? ¿No? Correcto. Eh, I mean, uh, again, what, and this is something that, that I said important also. I, in this, we are in innovation in Codelco, especially we're focusing in very key stuff and all the others we are outsourcing it. For example, um, we are, we are not, never going to be the best in dealing with maybe dust. So we outsource that to different companies that, and universities that are doing research on that, but, but we, I don't have a dust specialist. And uh, phyto remediation is also something that we outsource to, to environmental companies or to research centers, centers such as SMI from Australia, that they have a long road on sustainability. Um, and on female, I also wonder if the lack of female representation rings any bell? I think yes, and I think, uh, it's very good news that uh, that things are really improving, and that the comp co mining companies are really committed to improve the female representation. Uh, and this is a this is a step change in our industry, uh, and I'm very glad it's happening. Julian? Yeah, uh, I was. I, I guess I agree. Uh, uh, there there has to happen. A, a change in, in representation in general in the in the industry, also in the academic aspect of it, how many students we get, how many female faculty members we have in different mining departments. Um, one of the things um, that uh, at least in uh, at Queens we're doing is actually training our undergraduate students in, in cultural competency and EDI, so equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, and, and also on, on the relation with uh, indigenous peoples. I think those are, those are aspects that, in particular in Canada, are, are kind of in the agenda even of the government in a very explicit way. Uh, but I think as a mining industry, we should, uh, you know, we should encourage that and we should try to make, uh, to, to make things so that we end up with a fair representation of everyone in our industry as well, at all levels. If you look at the CEOs, of all the mining companies, there aren't many women there, uh, and there aren't many minorities represented there as well. So I think it's a, it's an issue for us to to work on. And 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 Stefania, sorry, she just uh, replied and asking about high rank positions, and she is correct. Um, maybe the issue in Chile with that is that uh, that people in high positions has has a forty years experience or so. And, and maybe in that in those times there no there were no many female students forty years back. So I think we are catching up, and we are gonna cut. We in Codelco at least we are trying to catch up from other industries. So we for females on on at C level or or senior executives we are trying to bring them from different industries as well. For both your answer. I don't know we have a uh, time um, more. Maybe we are kind of in the time. I just want to thank you, Sebastian and, and Julian, for your time. Uh, I don't know if you want to make another uh, something that you wanted to say before giving something that it was. No, I, I, I want to, yeah, I want to say goodbye. I want to thank you all for attending. And also, I want to expre express my optimism. Um, as I said, mining is still a very challenging, very intellectually challenging business. So that's good for the soul, right? And, and, and it's an industry that is healthy on the economics. 
So, so we see lots of activity uh, and we see that, that we are in a good position uh, for ahead uh, to bring uh, more innova innovators and females and indigenous people to work with us. I think we're moving forward. We have a future. We have a long tradition, but we also have a future. Um, and so and we have also a lot of challenges that are going to keep bright minds uh, very interested in what we're doing. So, so I think it's a good time for being mine and for being a miner. Thank you, thank you, Sebastian. Any closing words from? Yeah, I, I share that. I think I think our uh, our challenge is actually to communicate what mining is and and how interesting it is, how broad it is, how complex it is, and how challenging and interesting it is. Uh, we have, of course a lot in our hands, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, problems to solve and issues to try to improve. Um, but I think that's what makes it entertaining and, and, and a good career path for, you know, younger people. So hopefully we, we stay here for many years and we continue uh, increasing uh, what people know about mining. And thanks for uh, organizing this. Oh, thank you so much, Sebastian and Julian, and thank you everyone. We really appreciate your participation. And remember that the panel discussion is going to be available on ReadySafe YouTube channel. So, thank you. Thank you for, for attending and goodbye. A la prochaine.